First and foremost, thank you, Martin, for doing this. Thank you for your time, and it's a true pleasure to see you again. Back then, when you took over the helm at ACO in 2004, I think the company up to that point has made roughly, roughly 30 acquisitions mm -hmm. over the course of a 15-year time span. How did you actually manage such a complex portfolio? Because you've not only inherited these acquisitions, but you've made some select acquisitions ever since. In the first 15 years, uh, they didn't manage the acquisition. They just made acquisitions and they didn't have a, if you could, you could talk to the founders, they would reconfirm that the strategy was to buy everything which became available cheap and fast. Uh, so what we had to do, or my idea was to really uh, look for uh, post-merger integration and synergies. So when I joined, we had about 26, we had exactly 26 brands. We are now down to four. And thinking about that and, and taking into account though that even if you take a look at ACO today, so you have four brands, but you have operations across five continents. You have 10 lines of business ranging from high horsepower tractors all the way to grain storage. How do you actually manage that complexity, also from an organizational perspective? Yeah, we are very decentralized and we try to have the units, units tailored in a way that they are uh, really not too big and that management is completely in control of, uh, of running uh, the unit. And if you think about just your global presence for a moment, so you have operations not only in North America and Europe, which are arguably more developed markets, but also, of course, in Asia and Africa, which are rapidly changing environments. How do you actually manage that kind of complexity? We like to work with local management. Mm -hmm. So the Germans, for example, run their business mainly with Germans. And in Brazil, we mainly have Brazilian. We do have job rotation and we try to get people out also to different countries. But we are different in a way that we don't believe that it's the best solution to have Americans running all the overseas operations like some of our competitors do. Against that backdrop, what are actually the qualities in your leadership team that you're looking for? What are kind of the capabilities that you also want to build and how do you build them? We like people who are in a position to work well in a global environment, who understand different cultures and who also speak languages, which is sometimes a little bit difficult to find in the US. Let's switch gears and let's talk about the agricultural industry in more general terms. So applying our outside-in perspective, I would argue that not only from a speed of change, but also from a complexity perspective, the agriculture industry is undergoing huge amounts of change. Think about moving from selling iron, like high horsepower tractors, to, to selling solutions to enable precision farming. So what are you and what is ACCO actually going to do in order to ensure that you're emerging as the winner in this race? In the future, you will see the level of mechanization getting to the same amount in steps, not only in tractors, but also implements, harvesting combines and so on. And then this, uh, um, those implements have to be connected and they have not only to communicate well with each other, they also have to communicate with uh, products from other companies and other brands. And they have to take into consideration seeds, uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides and so on to get, let's say, into a situation where you really can optimize the whole process and you need to look at farming more with regard to the process instead of, st of saying today I, I use my tractor and next week I, do, I use my combine. With all this information and also all the data that is now abundantly available, just think about your own email inbox. It's always getting filled up. How do you actually manage from a leadership perspective to, to separate all the noise from the real important pieces of information. In farming, you need to think about uh, what will change in the future. And uh, right now, people always think that the master of uh, uh, the information is the tractor because it's the biggest investment typically. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pulling or carrying other implements. We think that in the future, uh, the, the driving force is the implement. So we think that implements will tell the tractor what to do, will define the speed, will define the turning radius and so on. So that's a major change, but I think this is the next step you will see. And how do you actually then manage to keep a strong finger on the pulse? So just to make sure that that you know what's happening on the end customer front and also on the front line in general. I, I know, for example, you're test driving all the new products yourself, but are there other mechanisms and processes? Yeah, you place? just meet with your customers and talk with them. So farmers are pretty outspoken. They are pretty normal people. 
Uh, so in our case, you don't have to work yourself through hierarchies. You just uh, visit customers, you visit dealers, and you need to make sure that you do it not only in one country or in one area of the world, but uh, spread it around a little bit. So once a year, I, I purposely visit customers in South America. I do that in the US on a frequent, on a regular basis, and in Europe as well. And uh, in the future, you have to do that also in Africa and China. We talk quite a bit about complexity and probably stating the obvious, but complexity doesn't only come with risk, it also comes with opportunities. What do you actually do in order to, to see some of these opportunities associated with complexity? I think it's very important to think in networks and to include not only your customer and your, your dealer, but also you need to include uh, certain related industries. Uh, so that means our tractors today can communicate uh, uh, with, uh, with a lot of other products. During harvest, our combine can already find out what the crop prices are. So if the, if the soybeans would be sold tomorrow, uh, when you need a part, uh, you can communicate with your dealer. Your dealer can communicate with you in order to tell you that you're maybe running too fast or that you don't have the right torque or whatsoever. Uh, and the farmer, through a simple app, uh, can basically uh, see where all his product is working and what it's doing, how much it's producing, uh, how much the fuel consumption is and things like that. So it's thinking in networks. As you're thinking about networks, do you have like deliberate targets like, for example, suppliers that you want to forge partnerships with horizontally, um, vertical partnerships? Yes, we have actually clearly defined uh, those partners we want to have a very good and very intense relationship with, and that can be also in implements. Uh, there are smaller family-owned companies in our industry who do certain things better than the big three. Uh, when you talk about seeding and tillage, when you talk about uh, certain uh, harvesting processes like, for example, grain harvesting or uh, um, when you talk about self-propelled vine harvesting and all kind of things, there are special specialty product producers uh, and you decide on your choice on, on partners. What is the, the legacy that you would actually want to, to leave behind in the company looking forward? Yeah, well, actually, I would like to make it a business which is too big to be taken over easily. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about 15 billions in revenue by 2016. And I would like to see margins at 12% by 2015. Uh, this includes a complete integration of all the acquisitions we have done during the first years of the company. Uh, and uh, we want to be uh, also the quality leader in customer perceived quality by 2016 as well. Martin, thank you so much for your time and for your perspectives. Thank you, Felix.